Please visit sleepapia.org to get more videos like this one, as well as audio and blog content. Join us at sleepapnea.org to be included in the conversation and updated whenever new programs are available. Thanks for joining us and enjoy. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for joining sleepapnea.org on our weekly speaker series every Tuesday at 3 p.m. Eastern Time. Uh, during the month of February, we are focusing on outreach for sleep apnea and sleep health awareness to underserved communities. And we are really happy to have Dr. Tommy Begay with us here today. He is a research assistant professor in the Department of Psychiatry, College of Medicine at the University of Arizona. And today, Dr. Begay is joining us to help us bring some, bring some insight and some understanding to the Native American community, uh, its relationship to trauma, and the overall effects it has on health and well-being. Um, it is important for sleepapnea.org to uh, do outreach in regards to health disparities. I recently read uh, an article this weekend in regards to a COVID update stating that um, Indigenous Americans are dying at two times the rate of white Americans. Uh, COVID has definitely brought health disparities to the forefront of the conversation, but they have been there for, for a long time. So we're very happy to have Dr. Begay here today with us to walk us through um, his community experience. And I'd also like to introduce uh, Eugenia Brooks. She is our sleepapnea.org resident blogger and fellow sleep apnea patient. And I know today's uh, conversation uh, holds a special place in her heart. So I'll let her speak for a minute before we turn it over to Dr. Begay. Absolutely. And thank you, Justine. Hope you do all is well by you. This is very close to my heart because, you know, aside from the obvious, um, I'm a mixed breed from here and the one half being black descendants of slaves and the other half being Native American. And um, I'm well versed on that because I knew my grandparents and my uh, mother's mother was half Blackfoot and her father was half Cherokee. And they were very proud of those facts and that background and they were they made sure that I understood as much about my heritage as they could squeeze into a fast moving first grand <laughs> but um I, I you know there's so much that was not part of what could be conveyed to me and sleep and the issues that not getting good rest and how it impacts your health was unfortunately one of those things. And in my case, it did me the disservice because not realizing the importance of getting good rest, not being aware of things like sleep apnea, it was able to play a negative role for far too long in my life. And now the other health issues that are impacting me, the comorbidities of sleep apnea, okay, really has me in, in a compromised health situation. And now with COVID, okay, all of this is trying to make a perfect storm. And, um, you know, to combat it, I really had to be strict about the rules. And, you know, it's been quite a while now, it's been a whole year and and still we're in the struggle. And so, you know, I didn't know what I knew then, but I know now and I can't get the word out to people enough. And when it comes to my communities, which are already under siege with so many disparities, I really feel like this is the nexus to get out because it's not something we're aware of and it's not something that's being conveyed to our communities, okay? And unfortunately, the largest portion is the baby boomers and we were point blank taught that it, people who slept were lazy. So we've got a whole psychological thing going on with us against that and it was so wrong. So 
you know, this is an important word to get out and, and, and for people to become aware of and do something about, because had I put the sleep apnea in check, I would not now be embattled by atrial fibrillation, congestive heart failure, rheumatoid arthritis, and whatever else is wrong with me. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that, Eugenia. I really appreciate that. Dr. Begay, I'm going to turn it over to you. Thank you again for joining us today. I know you have some slides you can share here. Yes. You set. Thank you, Justine. Yat e tami begay yin shi ya. She e ha shi shi ni shli do tori chi ni wa shi shi uh, welcome and thank you. I'm, uh, I'm honored to be here. I just uh, introduced myself in, uh, in Dene. Uh, that's uh, what we call ourselves, uh, also known as the Navajo of uh, Northeastern Arizona and also New Mexico and a little bit of uh, the state of Utah. That's really where, where I come from. I was uh, born and raised on the Navajo Nation, uh, leaving to attend the University of Arizona, and it feels like I've been here forever. I've uh, I've picked up my, my bachelor's uh, uh, BS in uh, animal health science. I have a, uh, an MPH, Master of Public Health, uh, focused on international health. And uh, my, my PhD is really looking at uh, toxic stress or in relation to cultural psychology. I'm a cultural psychologist by academic training. I, I wanna just kind of uh, point to the, my email address on the on this slide, and it really is uh, sort of, uh, if, if you have additional questions, please do not hesitate to uh, connect with me. Uh, I think that this is, this is a huge area, a huge topic, and I'm going to do my best to move through efficiently uh, as, as well as I can. But um, just, just a, I, I'm a, um, a, a, uh, a uh, faculty member of the um, Sleep Health and Wellness Program. I'm also a faculty affiliate with the Social Cognitive and Affective Neuroscience Laboratory. And I'm very grateful to be associated with these organizations or with these programs. Uh, namely, uh, we, we see a, 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 uh, an importance, as, as uh, Eugenia mentioned earlier, uh, the importance of sleep in terms of some of the outcomes, some of the some of the disease outcomes, and I just you know I think sleep plays a a, a restorative role on many levels. So I, I kind of move between uh, the boundary of physiology, neurophysiology. Any, every time you see that term neuro, we're referring to the brain or the nervous system. So it's really sort of that neurophysiology and also behavior. And if uh, collectively, if enough of us are doing that behavior, then it also impacts culture in terms of what becomes the, uh, the way we deal with things. Uh, the way we learn, uh, but really what I'm talking about is a worldview. So I want to talk a little bit about a, the, the, uh, the American Indian or indigenous worldview because this happens around the world, but I really want to focus on the indigenous people of North America, the American Indian, the Alaska Native. I, I, I always show this slide because it, there's, there's, there's so much power. Uh, power in terms of the relationship of movement, the relationship of, uh, you know, uh, we, we as human beings, we were, we were designed to move. We were designed to, uh, you know, to the, the, the process or the basis of homeostasis or balance, the balance between rest and movement and what happens during movement as we burn glucose or we burn blood sugar but there's also a relationship to the universe that grounds us to earth and this is that world view that you know this this for me this photo really uh captures this is a, a pow a powwow it's a native american com competitive dance but it's really sort of emulates also what we do in ceremony the relationship of taking the energy from the universe however we as human beings might do so, but that energy comes to us to to take action, and that's the empowering component. That's the the the, the, the part that we have a responsibility to care for ourselves, to care for our loved ones, to also care for the planet as we dance, that as we hear our heartbeat, 
it resonates with the beat of the drum. And as we move, we begin to acknowledge the power that we have. So this, this I always, you know, I make a habit of showing this slide because it really sort of encapsulates, you know, what health education, what wellness and what good health should be about. About, But I'm a cultural psychologist, as I mentioned, and uh, what that really entails is that there's a relationship between uh, the environment and, and biology, and everything that we do has the consequence of changing our, our, our neurophysiology. Again, the parts of the brain, whether it's a two ner nerve cells that come together, what we call neurons, the first time we do something, the more we do something, the thicker those connections come. So we, be, we create these neural pathways. And what I'm really talking about is the development of habit. And there are certain parts of the brain, there are four parts of the brain that I really focus on. One is the prefrontal cortex, or what's known as executive functioning. We do bus schedules, we do calculus. And then another part of the brain is really sort of the, the on the other spectrum or the other side of that, the autonomic nervous system. And that's really sort of that sympathetic, uh, parasympathetic part, you know, that, that uh, you know, autonomic rhymes with automatic, like our heart rate. Uh, there's another process called uh, peristalsis, the movement of our, of, of our food through our digestive system. As all the nutrients and, and energy are removed, we don't have to think about that. Our heartbeat, we don't have to think beat beat you know it there's a mechanism that takes care of that so when i speak a sympathetic nervous system i'm talking about that you know that stress response the heart begins to beat we're getting ready to 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 take action it's also referred to as the fight or flight mechanism the parasympathetic nervous system is that part of peace that part of calm so what goes up should come down but in certain environments when we have too much stress too much Stress is a really nice way of talking about fear and pain and how we can, on a, on a regular basis, we can habitually begin to think about the worst things that can happen. And I'm not, I'm not, I'm not saying we need to be, you know, we shouldn't, we shouldn't, we should ignore that. I'm saying that there's a balance between giving, allowing ourselves that peace, allowing ourselves that rest so that we can restore our other physiological mechanisms. And the other point I wanna make is I, I, uh, I was born and raised on the Navajo Nation. And I, as I mentioned earlier, I left uh, you know, my, my hometown of Sawmill to attend the University of Arizona. And I just kind of never left. You know? I picked up my, my, uh, you know, my doctorate degree here, but ultimately what has, what has uh, been in the back of my mind and really the essence of who I am and what I do has a lot to do with what was happening you know, with indigenous people and how that is associated with more uh, cultural historical forces such as historical trauma. And I just, I wanna kind of put, mention historical trauma because we don't really, you know, it's very easy to look at something on the surface without really understanding the roots, without really understanding the historical mechanisms that get us to this point of contemporary health, contemporary wellness. And there is a powerful story here. It's a, it's a human story, a human phenomenon. It happens around the world. This is not just indigenous people or Native American people. This is a, this is a biological you know, process. We adapt, we are you know, cells that that through genetics, our cells, you know, a good example, again, as a cultural psychologist that I often use is like going to the weight room. As we begin to lift weights, our muscle begins to, 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 to respond to that. It gets stronger so we can handle the weight. Then we add more weight. So what I'm talking about is we're getting big, we're growing in strength, but that's how our nervous system works. Also, as we begin to learn new things with a book, we get those a couple of nerve cells that come together. The more we do it, the thicker it becomes. And pretty soon we're, we, we, we're in love with reading. We read as often as we can. But the same is true with stress. The same is true with, uh, you know, growing up or being in an environment of, let's just say, childhood abuse or neglect or hunger or being in a place where our brain begins to adapt to that environment. And as a result of that, we are more prone to certain diseases as adults. We are more prone to certain psychiatric outcomes because of processes known as self-medication. So self-medication is really sort of a nice way of, you know, artificially trying to either anesthetize ourselves or 
remove us from that situation, remove us from that pain, remove us from that fear. But it's not just a physiological consequence. It also is, uh, becomes mobilized in our behavior. We begin to act out. Maybe we might even avoid stressful situations. Stressful situations like studying for an exam. If we don't study for an exam, it's almost like a self-fulfilling prophecy. The thing we're afraid of, we actually create by failing the exam because we didn't study for the, exam, for the, for the test. So um, this is a really busy slide. I just wanna to point to number one and number two, again, that neurophysiological, again, that physiology at a cellular level, at a genetic level, the changes that occur because of adverse childhood stress. I put experiences here because that's a term that's utilized, but ad adverse, again, those, those, uh, those stresses that occur over decades over long periods of time. I'm not just talking about, you know, somebody yelling at you one time or, or, or failing an exam and feeling bad about it. I'm talking about, you know, experiences that create changes, that those neurophysiological changes. Again, keeping in mind how if we, if we do something long enough, our, our physiology begins to change to it. So that's really what I'm interested in. And I focus on the, this HPA axis. Well, I'll, uh, there's a slide I have that talks a little bit more about that, but it's the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis. And again, this is a, you know, just part of the brain. It's actually the mechanism for, or the basis of our fight or flight mechanism that allows cortisol, you know, the, the energy we need to either fight and if we can't fight our way out of it, to run. And so that also works with another part of our nervous system, the sympathetic nervous system. Again, that, you know, that, uh, that part, that autonomic part and, and that the outcome is what we refer to as adrenaline. And adrenaline over a period of time, little stressors as adults soon become huge. We, we unload all of these stress response hormones and that's not good for the body. And it's also not good for our, our behavior because we become hypervigilant, hyper aroused. And those are just terms for, we look for scary situations, even when they don't exist. And that interferes with what we should need to be concentrating on, that mindfulness component. It's really hard to be mindful when we're afraid somebody's gonna hurt us or we're afraid that uh, you know, something's gonna happen to us. And that interferes with academic achievement, that interferes with the relationships we have, where we really want to become intimate you know, with, with certain people, with a, perhaps our parents, with a significant other. It's hard to do when we're moving, when our heart is racing and we're, you know, we're constantly looking for you know, bad things to happen to us. So that's what I, what I mean by hypervigilance and hyperarousal. But the other, the flip side, I see these issues as kind of, as I mentioned, two sides of the same coin. On one side, I just mentioned those, uh, those ad, the adversity, those uh, deficits. But on the other side, with indigenous people around the world, with Native Americans, there is a powerful worldview that takes into consideration hope and the power of hope and how we can begin to empower ourselves just as that slide of the dancer movement. Movement is the way we resolve our issues. Movement is the way we keep the balance like, in, in, within our own body systems of, of having insulin begin to burn off that, that, uh, that blood sugar in our body. So we have to have this, this balance. And my, my great grandmother is, a, is a, a Navajo healer. She's a herbologist. She collect plants and she, you know, she, she knew the, the relationship of the plants to the earth. So it comes with a philosophy. It's not just a, you know, more pharmacological. It's a, an understanding of the power of, of, of spirit and understanding. So when we, when we heal, Heal each other. It's it's more than just a pharmacological, physiological interaction. It's a belief. It's a it's a it's a and that belief really sort of enables our cells and our genetics to also begin to be begin to be part of the healing process. And so that's the other area that I study um, also. And but but namely, you know, these 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 health disparities. Uh, this is for Navajo Nation, uh, or I'm sorry, this is for American Indian Alaska Native, and it's Indian Health Service. That's IHS. Uh, 2010 stats, but accidents are three times higher than the general U.S. population. Diabetes is three times higher, again, than the U.S. population. Chronic liver disease, which is associated to alcohol, alcohol uh, abuse, 
and, and drug-induced deaths are, are much higher. Suicide, assaults are much higher. So for me, you know, it's what could be the driving force behind some of these issues. And, and as I will talk about a little bit later, it's a, what, what uh, my hypothesis is that this is associated to an augmentation, a change of culture that has resulted or is associated with historical trauma, especially what happened because of boarding schools. That boarding school system, as I will talk about later, is the removal of children from their families and placed in these institutions without empathy, without love, without care. And these kids were left to fend for themselves, what we now call toxic stress. That was the basis of how these kids were treated. These kids grow up, they have their own kids without empathy, without really an understanding of the benefits of parenting. So this is what I'm describing is an intergenerational process. So my great grandmother, the healer, talked about natural order. And, and the, the Navajo word is Dinepi in ya. Dinepi in ya means that, you know, unlike certain paradigms like science, we can't reduce things. We can't just pick out one part. It's like the human body. You can't just take out the liver. The liver serves a function. We need to look at what is what other body systems impact that liver. So the dine the inya, the people and how they live, we take into consideration. But my grandmother introduced the concept to me, and that was natural order. And what she was really talking about is homeostasis, the balance between night and day, the circadian rhythms, the balance between man and earth, the balance between feminine and masculine. So there has to be a balance and within each individual, the feminine and, and masculine concept, this resides in, 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 every, in every person. And what I'm really describing is the way of the warrior, that certain tasks are not reserved for certain, you know, certain genders. Women just don't take care of the, I mean, uh, uh, men take care of the children, men cook, women also, you know, are expected that if you have a flat tire, change a tire, you know, it's not, you know, you don't sit in, in distress on the side of the road. So, so these are, these are, again, are, are, uh, you know, again, you, uh, concepts that reside in every individual. So, you know, th those are, those are inter uh, concepts that, that really sort of generate my academic and my professional uh, perspective, but also B, you know, my own personal experience moving through this darkness and realizing what, uh, what had happened coming from a place of, you know, of, uh, 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 of violence coming from a place of alcoholism and being also a part of that. And really what, what is the basis for that behavior? But more importantly, what is the resilient aspect that moves us through darkness, that allows us to, to grow, to allow us, allows us to be strong and a participant of the universe? And that's the other side of the coin that I mentioned earlier, the power of, of, a, you know, of, a, of a worldview, of a psychology, if you will, an indigenous psychology that follows the patterns of the universe. And we'll refer to that universe anyway, our spiritual, our spiritual uh, uh, beliefs uh, you know, pr provide for us, or maybe it's a religious belief, but they, there is a, 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 a power that we take in from the universe that balances the planets, it balances us. And we also take into consideration the power of our mother earth. And so this psychology offers also a healing, also offers an, a, an empowerment. So um, there's an uh, image of my, my, my great grandmother and that little guy on the, on the left, is, you might recognize him today. He's still wearing the blue shirt. Uh, he likes the cowboy, like the Western shirts. Uh, but but I, I spent a significant amount of time with my, my great grandmother. And again, from a psychosocial health perspective, it's really sort of this indigenous worldview that drives also the balance of what we think, what we do, which I, I'm referring to eating, getting exercise, and also empowering ourselves with music, with even our belief systems. You know, I, I, uh, I have conversations with my colleagues here in terms of science and really, well, is it, are we talking about a placebo effect? Well, I, you know, I don't know what we're talking about, but the bottom line is, if it is a placebo effect, our, our physiology has changed as if there was actually something there. So 
I, regardless of whether you know there is a re, a, a substance of or an organic substance or not, the benefits of believe what belief does, what hope does, and how hope can fuel us into taking action and taking care of ourselves and taking care of the planet. I often show this this image also. It's my my uncle uh, Frank Frank <clears> Totichini. <throat> yeah, we always say yeah when somebody has passed on. Uh, I was very intrigued with my uncle. He was a a code talker. He was a Marine. And, and anybody who knows about the military, you know, he was, a, you know, he went through the, you know, the blood and guts training. And I don't, I don't say that, you know, with, uh, I say that with the utmost respect. Uh, it's, you know, my, my, my uncle has seen some things. He's seen some trauma. He's talked about some things that he has done, but the way he carries himself today. In this photo, he sh he's uh, pictured with his grandson, but he was a very gentle man. He was a very quiet man. He's more on the end of the parasympathetic, peaceful component of our nervous system. And that just really, how can that be? I mean, this man is not, he's not, I mean, I, I don't mean any disrespect, but you don't see the post-trauma with him, although he has been through, he has seen some things. He's been a part of some atrocious, you know, activities. And so I, for, for, I began to really sort of take interest and study. And, and he's, a, you know, a, again, the, the power of, of a worldview, of a psychology, and how that sets in to our nervous system, how belief can, can calm us down. I mean, we can just sit here and think about maybe speeding 85 miles per hour, seeing the red and blue lights, getting pulled over and getting a ticket. We, our, our palms might begin to get sweaty. Our heart might start to beat because of that, just thinking about that, that fearful experience. But the opposite's true too. You know, there are times when I often, when I wanna bring my physiology down, when I wanna bring my body down, I think of a place, we have Mount Lemon, which is our mountain to the north of, of Tucson. There's a place I go to, it's at the very top, past the ski lodge, and there's a, one, a beautiful meadow with grass and ponderosa pine, and it's about 25 degrees cooler than it is here in Tucson, kind of a place I grew up in. But my point is that place brings me tremendous amount of peace and relaxation. I can get there just by thinking about it. I can bring my physiology down. So what I'm getting at is the power of our worldviews, the power of our psychologies, what we choose to engage in. You know, is, 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 uh, is, did somebody cut me off in traffic or was it was an accident? I, you know, in my interpretation, I can decide that. I can flip them off. I can yell something. I can get my stress response system all jacked up and uh, if I choose to, or I can choose to, again, in, with, with the idea of health and wellness, I can let it go. It, I got to move my way and that individual individual's got to go their way. So again, I, I don't mean to, you know, just keep beating this over and over again, but this is really sort of the worldview of the indigenous. And so I want to just, you know, since um, I, I took up a little bit more time that I wanted explaining, you know, the, the previous slides, but there's a, the, the Navajo, the Diné philosophy, and, and I, you know, it, the best I could, you know, I translated that in English, everlasting and beautiful living. It's a psychology. It's the way we choose to look at things, but it's not a passive, you get run over. It's a, uh, you know, as, as I will, uh, you know, talk to it uh, later at the bottom, you know, there's a, what we call the Navajo blessing way. The Navajo blessing way is sort of the stalk of this corn. It's the, the centerpiece that runs through the whole plant. And we can see, you know, a, a, a growth of corn coming off of that. And this slide represents, you know, the various categories of ceremony that come off of that stock. And as a result, every ceremony, I'm, I'm referring to Hajjonj at the bottom part of this, the blessing way, every ceremony opens and closes with a blessing way prayer. And in the, in, the, in the initial, in the first blessing way prayer, this is my translation. This is what I hear. This is uh, how I use this prayer. And it talks about corn pollen. Tatatin is that, uh, you know, that sacred item, the most sacred item a, a Navajo has. You pray with it to the east in the mornings. You keep that, that corn pollen pouch in your dominant hand. You know, I have this image as I wake up in the morning, as I pray in the morning, I have in my dominant hand the corn pollen, the sacred corn pollen. 
but in my less dominant hand, in my left hand, I carry the arrowhead. And the arrowhead represents you take a stand and you fight. What are we fighting for? We're fighting for the power of the sacred. And I've soon learned that that, that term sacred to me means love, the sharing of love, the receipt, the re receiving love from the universe, however we choose to see or identify with that. But that power is, is a there for me to utilize. And as I utilize it, then I also share it. And what I'm sharing is doing, utilizing my creativity, my experience, and my opportunities. So that's the balance between corn pollen and arrowhead. It's the basis of Diné philosophy. And this is a Diné image, and that's a, the holy people are, you know, the sort of a, when I talk about human integrity, that's the representation of love, of strength of compassion, of empathy. We, we don't always have that as human beings, but we strive for it because it makes our lives, we interact. It also provides for health and wellness from a neurophysiological perspective of that sympathetic nervous system, that fight or flight mechanism coming back down to that place of peace and calm. So I'm not even gonna try to explain this, but this is sort of the, you know, I teach a class, American Indian uh, Wellness and, uh, or American Indian Medicine and Wellness at the university every, every now and then. But we spend a couple of weeks with this slide. And in the upper right hand corner is a, my description or my understanding of that universal energy. The circle represents the individual. This energy, if we choose, runs through us. And the, the connection or hope is how we connect to that. But it grounds us to earth and through our behavior and through our action. So I used a circle intentionally because it represents spiritual, mental, physical, and emotional aspects of the individual. So again, I just summarize, this is the worldview and my interpretation or my understanding of the worldview of the indigenous, which takes into consideration our relationship with the universe, but also our responsibilities and relationship with, uh, with our mother or our mother earth. So I want to just make that, you know, make that, make that distinction. Um, my, again, as I mentioned earlier, I, at the top of the slide, you can read the health disparities. They have to do with chronic stress. They have to do also with, with dealing with fear, learn behaviors of dealing with fear through self-medication, self-medication with substances, self-medication with food, self-medication perhaps with, with behaviors maybe even uh, uh, um, sexuality or maybe even gambling or uh, some other behaviors that stimulate nucleus accumbens and the ventral tegmental area, what we call the pleasure centers of the brain. And so this, this slide just really sort of summarizes how th those historical traumatic uh, events have created this, these cultural changes. And those cultural changes are intergenerational, but they are also they are also epigenetic. They're also physiological. In other words, our genome can be impacted by events, external events or environmental be events. But ultimately, this, this sends or changes the culture, a culture of chronic stress. So we no longer have outsiders coming in and doing this. We take on a family relationship where utilizing anger, utilizing pain to not communicate, but maybe manipulate. So we activate the, the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis, the sympathetic nervous system, but the outcomes are chronic diseases or what I study, cardiometabolic diseases. Cardio in terms of the heart, metabolic diseases in terms of that fight or flight mechanism, which really alludes to the amount of sugar, you know, that's released into the bloodstream and also the insulin that needs to bring that sugar into the cell so it can be utilized. But if there's, if there is no real fight or flight mechanism, in other words, if we're thinking about it, all of this stress hormones and, and uh, pro-inflammatory cytokines get released and our body is trying to deal with that. And to me, that's the basis of health disparities as well as hyperarousal, hypervigilance, as I mentioned.
mentioned earlier, you know, that agitation, that anger, that violence, that sometimes we need to self-medicate ourselves, maybe with alcohol, maybe with another drug, or maybe with those comfort foods. And those comfort foods, the, you know, they're usually high, saturated, high in saturated fats, that, but they, they're, you know, evolutionary. They serve us a purpose. There's a reason why they're comfort. There's a reason why we like certain foods. There's an evolutionary reason for that. So we could seek those out because we don't know when the next time we were going to get another meal like that was. But nowadays we get that go right around the corner and we can find nice crispy French fries or other foods that, uh, you know, would uh, are high in saturated fat. But yet, you know, we are not, you know, we're not, we're not, uh, we're not metabolizing the, the, that energy so that uh, we're not, uh, we're not burning off the calories that are associated with some of those foods. So there's a behavioral and health issues that come with, again, are associated with historical trauma. So I, I just, I don't want to even spend time with this, except I've, we've talked, I've talked about this, but there is a physiological connection in terms of chronic stress or what happens with stress and the outcome. And I, I sort of outline the problems at the bottom, which I talk to very loosely. I mean, I could talk about this all day. Um, if you had the time, uh, obviously we've got other things we need to do, but I just wanted to, again, allude or just make the point. There's a physiological explanation for the, 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 the impact of chronic stress and how that translates into disease processes. And this is, again, just a, that fight or flight, that sympathetic nervous system. Things get jacked up. We get ready to fight or, or, or run. But on the flip side of that, part of natural order, part of this indigenous worldview, we have to return to this place of peace, this place of calm, and especially this place where we sleep and what happens when we do sleep. So this is a you know an image of really sort of what my 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 uh, you know my focus as far as a as a an acad academic person as a researcher uh, you know I've talked about chronic stress but how does chronic stress impact sleep health and how together stress and and poor sleep you know translate into cardiometabolic diseases or again those diseases of blood vessels of the heart. And also are, you know, when we talk about diabetes, when we talk about obesity, how are, how are these, these, you know, these states of health related to poor sleep? And also how stress, again, that, that activation of, uh, of pro-inflammatory uh, cytokines and how inflammation is also related to cardiovascular disease. So this is really the nice, the nice, neat triangle that, you know, brings bring me to, you know, the, the academic institutions, bring me to research. I have a, a, what's known as a diversity supplement right now, looking at a Mexican-American population as part of the Nogales Cardiometabolic Health and Sleep Study, where we're looking at the, the effects of acculturation of people coming from Mexico into the United States in the area of Nogales. My focus is really, you know, what, what do we know about children, adverse childhood stress, and also intergenerational trauma? Are, are some of these behaviors being passed on, not only epigenetically, but also as far as behavior is concerned? And I just, the next part of this uh, talk, it really sort of focuses on, you know, what is it about historical trauma? And again, I just, these are real handcuffs that were used. This is actually uh, a United States federal policy of kill the Indian, save the man. One strategy was to take all the children from their families and place them in these institutions and begin to treat them as middle-class Americans. This slide really sort of shows as a, an individual that went into a boarding school on the left and what he looked like, you know, uh, a, 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 a few years afterward in terms of, you know, the changes that went through. But really sort of what, what was not taken into consideration is the power of empathy and empathy and compassion and love in association or in, 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 as opposite of, you know, toxic stress, that stress that we, that children go through where they don't have help from a parent. They don't have help from me, from, from others. They are dealing with their fear by themselves. They're dealing with their emotional pain by themselves. 
So this manifests also in, again, physiological, neurophysiological outcomes. So briefly, just, you know, historical trauma, again, the, the legacy of numerous traumatic events of community experiences over generations. Again, this is not, uh, when we talk about trauma, we're not talking about one thing that happens. We're talking about either prison camps that became Indian reservations or with these children being removed from their families and placed into you know, boarding school systems um, or boarding school situations. This really sort of just lists what those historical traumatic uh, experiences were. Community massacres, genocidal policies, forced relocation, the prohibition of spiritual and cultural practices, including getting your mouth washed out with soap whenever you spoke your native tongue. And then the last one, as I mentioned, the, you know, the, what I think has been the greatest force, you know, as far as historical trauma is concerned with augmenting the, the culture of the American Indian, the forced removal of children through Indian boarding school policies. And, you know, sort of, sort of some of the outcomes that we're seeing today of interpersonal increases in interpersonal violence, of child abuse and neglect, of poor health, which again, cardiometabolic diseases and also those diseases that grow out of, uh, grow out of, uh, of, uh, of, of, um, of uh, um, self-medication. Poor academic achievement. Again, there, you know, which I didn't really talk about. The brain, the, the changes to the brain make it very difficult for the transformation of short-term memory to long-term memory. And also, one of the greatest, greatest contributions of sleep is that's when, you know, in 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 uh, in REM sleep, rapid eye movement sleep, short-term memory gets converted to long-term memory. And that's really what academic achievement is about, is being able to remember what you learned one day to be able to pass a, uh, an examination the next day or, you know, several weeks down the road. And if that's not happening, our children aren't learning. And so, and the other, the other issue is really sort of more, you know, more uh, what the, the interaction of, of groups outside of the native uh, people. And this is, this is really sort of a, uh, a, a very busy slide of a the cycle of how acts of genocide or historical trauma really sort of, uh, you know, begin to change the culture, create a cultural disconnect. And there's a, you know, I want to just emphasize this, uh, you know, the, this cycle on the lower left, when the, the lower left-hand corner intergenerational, self-perpetuating, self-inflicting coping behaviors that are coupled with other things like poverty and some of the other more social, social issues become grounded in this cycle, this intergenerational cycle. That's all I will say with that, about that. You know, this is, you know, we, I could spend a couple of days talking about this, uh, obviously. And, uh, but, but really sort of the outcomes, as I already mentioned, these, out, these uh, changes to culture, and, uh, you know, as taking learning, taking a lesson from my, my great grandmother and returning back to natural order to begin to heal the nervous system, you know, begin to calm that sympathetic nervous system down, you know, through either, you know, what, uh, what I utilize on a regular basis as talking circles, talking circle, which is again, a, a relationship utilizing the eagle feather burning sage, but the outcome is very similar to not the same, very similar to similar to cognitive behavioral therapy. So, you know, again, these are ways of, again, beginning to calm that nervous system, that system down. But they're also, this is really sort of that, uh, you know, that the aspect of relearning skills to deal with, with stress. I mean, if somebody cuts me off in traffic, I have a choice now. Do I flip them off and get angry or do I just let it go because I realize the impact it has on my health? That's all I had to present. Great. Thank you so much. I apologize. I went over. That's okay. <laughs> That's okay. No, I, you know, we have talked, uh, you know, internally with our team and, you know, one of the reasons we wanted to have you join us today is that, you know, we're reaching out to all types of uh, patients and patient communities. And, you know, it's often, um, you know, when we talk about outreach, m most of the two groups that get mentioned are black and brown communities. But just as I mentioned before, you know, reading that recent article about the American Indian and the situation with COVID, um, you know, it's, it's, it's something that doesn't get talked about. And, you know, from our perspective as a patient advocacy organization, we're trying to get all communities, all patients to, you know, have a voice, you know, participate in, in the information and education and awareness that we have to offer and to, you know, have a firm understanding of 
what quality sleep is and, and how you can uh, get on the journey to go ahead and um, have, um, you know, diagnosis and treatment of it. So we're, we were so excited to have you today to, you know, bring this other community into more light for, for the rest of us out there. Yeah. Eugenia, you have anything else to say? I mean, you pretty much said it all. I mean, uh, and in and, and his conversation, okay, he, he gave us some insight about how these things are all connected and, you know, good health requires a process like everything else. It's a process. And um, when you have diversity going on in the process and negative impact, it's going to not just impact the obvious, but many other things not so obvious. But at the end of the day, it translates into poor health and um, poor quality of life. And uh, so there it is. Yeah. And there's a <laughs> lot of similar, you know, a lot of the um, co-occurring conditions that, that you mentioned are, you know, what our community is seeing, cardiovascular issues, diabetes issues, you know, just as you described before, everything is, 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 is circular and encompassing. They, you know, your, your sleep bleeds into those cor comorbidities, the stress that you're having with your life bleeds into those comorbidities. You know, you, you describe that very well for all of us because it is where, you know, it is one system that we're all, that we're all working with here. So. Right, right. I, I just want to make one, one small point and that's really yeah. sort of a, you know, an understanding of for, for many groups around the world, but for many of us in, in the United States, you know, the, the forces of cultural, historical, you know, value of understanding how certain groups get treated. I mean, we're, we're you know, just, just on the surface, you know, how with, with the COVID-19 vaccine, you know, which groups are getting vaccinated, which groups are getting left out, and really how, how does that, you know, how does that work? And also really sort of looking at power and, uh, you know, our, our political system, as much as we would like to think, is really sort of serves us all. But really, where is the power and how do individuals or how do groups hang on to that power? And what is that? How does that translate into things that get done, whether you know, we're talking about voting or whether we're talking about some other, you know, some other issues? But it is part of these cultural historical forces that also need to be, you know, sort of taken into consideration so that we can, we can begin, we as individuals can, can begin to empower ourselves to move through it, not in a, you know, not in a, in an angry negative way, but really in a constructive, in a plan that really sort of, uh, you know, we, it's almost like a research process in itself. You have a hypothesis, you test that hypothesis, you take action. And if it doesn't work, you tweak it, you figure out, you do something else so that you're constantly moving, just like the image of the dancer, you know, of the color, of the movement, of the heartbeat, of the drumbeat. We keep moving through these, these issues. We become resilient. And that's the model of resiliency that, you know, I really want to sort of in, you know, leave here is that we have in, in, our, in our ways we have that. Our grandmothers have had it. You know, we were talking earlier about some of these sayings, you know, of a, an apple a day keeps the doctor away. I mean, really, that, that's, a, again, the, an, exper an experiment. We saw the apple somehow improving health. And so these sayings come out of that. But that's science, you know. We are all partaking in science in some way or another. But the, the outcome is really sort of what is it? How do we become more resilient? How do we become more healthy? That's yes. what this is all about. That's exactly. what bringing us all together is all about, is sharing those ideas. So yes. thank you very much for that opportunity. Yeah, no, thank you for sharing all of the information today. Um, really happy to have you here with us. Thank you, Eugenia, for joining us. And we'll see you all next week, uh, next Tuesday at 3 p.m. Eastern time. Thank you for joining us today. Be an awake angel and you can help those financially impacted by COVID-19. Just $50 can provide two CPAP masks to someone in need. Please visit sleephappia.org slash donate for details. The ASAA is a patient-focused organization. 
Please like and subscribe to our YouTube page, join us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram or sleepapnea.org and you can join the conversation. It's all free.